Hi, everybody. Uh, so if you're watching this video, you're probably taking pre-calculus. And uh, if you watch the other 1.3 video, I mentioned that there were a few topics I was skipping. So I'd like to go back and do those now. Uh, so here's the list of everything that's in 1.3. The things that are in bold here uh, identify intervals on which a function increases, decreases, or is constant. Use graphs to locate relative maxima or minima. And then down here, understand and use piecewise functions. Uh, I skipped those three topics completely when I covered them in trigonometry. And I also want to show you a couple more uh, fancier examples of finding and simplifying a function's difference quotient. All right, so starting with increasing, decreasing, and constant functions, um, when I read these definitions to you, it's going to sound uh, kind of complicated, a little confusing. In everyday English, it's a very simple concept, so let's, uh, but it's a very important concept for calculus. So let's take a look. A function is increasing on an open interval i if f of x1 is less than f of x2 whenever x1 is less than x2 for any x1 and x2 in the interval. So after I read uh, these definitions, I'm going to switch over to my tablet and draw you some pictures uh, that I think will make this a lot easier to understand. A function is decreasing on an open interval i if f of x1 is greater than f of x2 whenever x1 is less than x2 for any x1 and x2 in the interval. And finally, a function is constant on an open interval i if f of x1 is equal to f of x2 for any x1 and x2 in the interval. So let's switch over to the tablet up here. Okay, so starting with increasing. All right, so remember it said f of x1 is less than f of x2 whenever x1 is less than x2. So let's say uh, this is my open interval i. An open interval is an interval that does not include its endpoints, and there are some sort of technical reasons that we require the, uh, the interval to be open. I'm not going to bother you with those right now. So let's say here's x1 and here's x2. Remember x1 has to be less than x2. Uh, and it says that that guarantees that f of x1 is less than f of x2. Remember that f of x1 and f of x2 are y values. So let's put those up here. Oops. Okay. Now remember, this has to work for any x1 and x2 in the interval that I pick. So what this means basically is just that your fun the graph of your function is rising as you go from left to right over that whole entire interval. So that's how you say that in plain old everyday English. Again, it is a very important concept in calculus. Let's go over to decreasing. So again, uh, we start with x1 less than x2. And this time it says that f of x1 is greater than f of x2. So we'll just have these trade places. You can probably guess exactly what I'm gonna say. So a decreasing function means that the, the graph of the function is falling as you go from left to right. Very, very simple concept with a confusing definition. That's pretty common in math. All right. Uh, and then finally, constant. So constant said, if I pick any x1 and x2 in the interval, this time I don't care which one's bigger. Uh, f of x1 is going to equal f of x2. So those two y values will be the same, for example, here. 
so basically what's happening here is that the this piece of the graph of the function is just going to be a horizontal line. I don't know what it does outside the interval. I don't really care, uh, but that's inside the interval. All right, so let's go back to the presentation. All right, and here's an example. They want me to state the intervals on which the given function is increasing decreasing or constant. So you're always going to state these intervals as open intervals, intervals that do not include the endpoints. So you just look over uh, the graph of this function. Starting with increasing, I'm looking for all the intervals where the function is rising from left to right. So I see that's happening here all the way up to this point. Looks like that occurs at x equals negative one. And also, <clears throat> starting here at x equals 1 and going this way. So there are two intervals on which this function is increasing. And uh, let's see, those, um, okay, spoiler alert. <laughs> right. The function is increasing on the interval from negative infinity to negative 1. Remember, that's another way of saying x is less than negative 1. And skipping down here. Uh, it's also increasing on the interval from 1 to infinity for x greater than 1. Now decreasing, remember that means falling from left to right. That happens from negative 1 to 1. All right? So it's decreasing on the interval from negative 1 to 1 for x between negative 1 and 1. Uh, and this function is not constant anywhere. You can see it doesn't have any uh, horizontal line segments on it. All right, uh, very closely related to that concept is the concept of relative maximum and relative minimum. And again, it has a complicated sounding definition, but it's a very simple concept. A function value f of a is a relative maximum of f if there exists an open interval containing a such that f of a is greater than f of x for all x not equal to a in the open interval. And I'm gonna draw you a picture of this. Okay, similarly, a function value f of b is a relative minimum of f if there exists an open interval containing b such that f of b is less than f of x for all x not equal to b in the open interval. So let's go back to the tablet so I can draw you some pictures. So basically a relative maximum is just supposed to be a high point on the graph. So let's say that I have a graph that looks something like this. Okay. So here is my value A. All right, so I wanna say that there is a relative maximum occurring at this point. So over here is the y value f of a. Okay, so what that definition said is that this is a relative maximum because there does exist an open interval, for example, this one right here, for which f, uh, this point where y equals f of a is the high, I like to say the highest point in the neighborhood. So if you look at what the function looks like over that little open interval. Um, this point, a comma f of a, is definitely the highest point in the neighborhood, okay? So that makes, um, <clears throat> that makes f of a a relative maximum. f of a is a relative maximum. Sometimes they might ask you at what X value does the relative maximum occur? And then you would, uh, you would give the X value, uh, which we're calling A. So I'm gonna say it occurs at X equals A. All right. And then similarly, uh, relative minimum would be the lowest point in the neighborhood. 
So here is B. So if I put some little open interval around B, uh, this point B comma F of B is the lowest point in the neighborhood. Okay. So here is your, now the reason it's called a relative maximum, a relative maximum is because it may not be the highest point on the whole entire graph. Okay. When you get to calculus, you're going to study uh, re relative maximum and also, um, oh gosh, absolute maximum. That's what it's called. Spaced it there for a second. So here is your relative maximum. Here is your relative minimum. Okay, but notice that neither one of those is a, an absolute. Uh, and by the way, the collective term for maximum and minimum is extremum. Uh, an extremum can be either a maximum or a minimum. So notice that neither one of those is an absolute. There are higher points uh, than this one and there are lower points than this one. <clears throat> All right, so going back to <clears throat> the presentation. All right, looks like the same example. They want us to identify the relative maxima and minima for the graph of F and they've already got those points labeled on the graph. F has a relative maximum at X equals negative one. F has a relative minimum at X equals one. And I notice that they don't say anything about what is that relative maximum or relative minimum value. Uh, it looks like the relative maximum value might be two and the relative minimum value might be negative two. Okay. All right, that brings us to piecewise functions. A function that is defined by two or more equations over a specified domain is called a piecewise function. So here's an example. Given the function C of T equals 20, if zero is less than or equal to T is less than or equal to 60, or 20 plus 0.4 times T minus 60, if T is greater than 60. They want us to, first of all, find C of 40. So the way this works <clears throat> is, first of all, you look at these two if statements and decide which one fits. Uh, in this case, 40 is between 0 and 60. So if uh, T is between 0 and 60, this function is just going to output 20. It doesn't do anything specific with the value of T. However, uh, C of 80, that fits this rule. Uh, 80 is greater than 60. So now I'm going to plug the number 80 into this function, into this rule. And that's going to give me 20 plus 4, uh, 0.4 times 80 minus 60. And that comes out to 28. All right, you can also graph piecewise functions. So here's a function defined by f of x equals three, if x is less than or equal to negative one, or x minus two, if x is greater than negative one. So what we're going to do is graph f in two parts using a partial table of coordinates for each piece of the graph. So notice that <clears throat> in this table over here, I'm using all x values that are less than or equal to negative one. I call this rule number one. And as long as x is less than or equal to negative one, f of x is going to equal three, all right? So that's going to give us this point, uh, these points on the graph of f. And then over here, I'm going to use uh, negative one, zero, one. Now, this is set up just a little differently than how I usually do it. I want to, um, I want to hit the pause button on this one right here for just a second. Okay. The other two values of X uh, do fit this rule. They are greater than negative one. 
Uh, so as long as x is greater than negative one, this function just says to subtract two from that value of x. So in this case, you would have zero minus two, which is negative two, and one minus two, which is negative one. So it'll give you these two points. Um, I think I'm gonna come back to this thing in just a second. Let's see what this graph looks like so far. Oh dear. Oh, okay. So here's the graph. I think I put this in here so I could draw it on the whiteboard when I'm actually in a classroom. Okay. So uh, here is here are the points that came from the table on the left. I hope this is not too distracting. I'd like to leave it there so I can go back and look at that other point that I skipped. Uh, here's negative one, three, negative two, three, negative three, three. So those all came from that uh, left table. And then here is zero, negative two, and one, negative one. So those two points we looked at on the other table. So now I wanna talk about this. Notice that this rule in rule number two applies for all x greater than negative one. And we're talking about real numbers right now, all right? So not just whole numbers, okay? so. This point here is kind of special because it really doesn't belong on the graph. Um, what that's telling me is how far down to draw that piece of the graph. Okay, So, you know, it kind of goes down this way and it continues all the way up to, I think we can get rid of this now, all the way up to the point where x equals negative 1. So uh, that point that I had circled there, you know, in the table, that's going to tell you where to put a hole in the graph of f. Um, most piecewise functions, not all of them, but most of them uh, do have a hole in them somewhere to use the language of calculus. Um, this break in the graph is what we call a jump discontinuity, right? Discontinuity means a break in the graph, all right? If you have to pick up your pencil while you're drawing the graph, uh, that means that the graph is discontinuous, okay? So that point, negative one, negative three, it does not belong to the graph of F, but the graph does go right up to that point uh, and stops just short of that point. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, I know that when I teach intermediate algebra, this is uh, a topic that's very difficult for my intermediate algebra students. All right, let's see. What was going on? There we go. All right, so the last thing I want to look at here, uh, in the trigonometry video, I did a couple of examples of difference quotients. This is a, another very, very important topic for calculus. So remember the expression f at x plus h minus f of x all over h for h not equal to zero is called the difference quotient of the function f. So you saw some relatively simple examples in the trigonometry video. So now I want to look at a couple that are uh, a little more challenging for pre-calculus. So this one says, if f of x equals the square root of 2x plus 3, we want to find and simplify f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. So I'm going to switch over to the tablet. OK, so that function was f of x equals the square root of 2x plus 3. So one thing that I think is very helpful for functions when you're working with functions in this way is to think of the function without the x, sort of like this, because the very next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to see what happens when I replace the x with an x plus h. And I think I'll do that in a different color. 
So here comes f at x plus h. Okay. So now when I write out my whole difference quotient, it is going to look like this. And just a heads up, I am probably not going to have room on this screen to do the whole problem. I'm probably going to have to go over onto another one. Okay. So let's replace f at x plus h with that thing there on the second line. <clears throat> Looks like this. Uh, and then I subtract f of x, the original f of x, which is the square root of 2x plus 3. And that is all over h. Okay. So what I need to do is simplify this thing. And um, I think in every single case of doing one of these problems, uh, what's going to happen is this H right here is going to disappear somehow. All right. Now, unfortunately, the trick that I'm going to pull, uh, there is no way that it's going to fit in this little space over here. <laughs> so I'm going to have to copy. I suppose I can. Nope. Wishful thinking. I was hoping I could just drag the screen over. Okay, so right now I'm just copying uh, exactly what I have up there. Think about how can I make these uh, square roots disappear. Okay. All right, so that's something that we did go over in the trigonometry class at least in my trigonometry class and hopefully in yours. The way that you can get rid of those square roots on the top is by rationalizing the numerator. So I am going to multiply the top and the bottom of this expression by the conjugate of what you have on top here. So that's going to look like the square root of 2 times x plus h plus 3 plus the square root of 2x plus 3. Do that on the top and on the bottom. Now, <clears throat> the reason I'm doing that is because uh, you have two expressions uh, in, the, in your numerators, and they have the form a minus b and a plus b. So hopefully you remember that when you multiply an a plus b times an a minus b, what you get is an a squared minus b squared. And I'm excited about that because when I multiply those two uh, expressions together, this one and this one, those radicals are going to get squared which means that the radicals are going to disappear. Okay, So let's see what that looks like. When you square the square root of 2 times x plus h plus 3, you're just going to get 2 times x plus h plus 3. And then when you square the square root of 2x plus 3, you're just going to get 2x plus 3. Now you have to be very careful. I am subtracting 2x plus 3. So that 2x plus 3 has to go in parentheses. Okay. Now I am going to have kind of a big mess in the denominator. Fortunately, that's not going to matter too much. I've got my original h. And then I've got that conjugate that I multiplied, this thing over here. I am stuck with that. But as you will see in a minute, I don't really care that I'm stuck with that. Really, the goal in trigonometry and precalculus is just to make that H on the bottom disappear. When you get to calculus, uh, you're going to take the final step, which I will just go ahead and tell you is going to be to let H get smaller and smaller and smaller. Let it get as close to zero as it wants to. And um, so you, in order for that to make sense, you really need this H on the bottom 
uh, to disappear. All right. So we're almost there. <clears throat> I can actually almost fit this problem just on the one screen. So upstairs, uh, I'm going to distribute this two, and that's going to give me two X plus two H plus three. And then if I distribute this minus sign, that's going to give me minus two X minus three. And then I've got this thing, which I'm going to try to squeeze in here. All right, we are almost there. I know it's probably not the prettiest problem you've ever done. All right, but at some point, a whole bunch of stuff starts to drop out. Uh, the two X's cancel and the three and the minus three cancel. And that just leaves me with two H over H times this thing. So I think we are almost done. I'm just gonna go over to here. So we're left with two H over H times, oops, the square root of two times X plus H plus three plus the square root of two X plus three. So finally, these H's cancel out and I am left with my simplified difference quotient, which is two, oh well, two over the square root of two times X plus H plus three plus the square root of two X plus three. All right, so when you're sitting in your calculus class and you get it in that form, now you'll be able to talk about what happens as you let H get smaller and smaller and smaller and approach zero. All right, let's switch back to the presentation. I have just one more example, oops, of difference quotients to show you, the kind that I would not cover in a trigonometry class. <clears throat> and that's this one here, another two X plus three. I did not do that on purpose. <clears throat> All right, if F of X is one over two X plus three, we wanna find and simplify the difference quotient, which is F of X plus H minus F of X over H. All right, so switching back to the tablet. Here we go. So the function is f of x equals one over two x plus three. So remember the first thing I like to do is write the function with a blank space instead of the x. And then I am going to fill in that blank space with an X plus H. All right. So now I can uh, build my difference quotient. F of X plus H. minus f of x all over h is going to be one over two times x plus h plus three minus the original f of x, which is one over two x plus three, and that is all over h. All right, <clears throat> so uh, again, I have to simplify this thing in a way that's gonna make that H on the bottom disappear. And once again, I was not thinking ahead. I should have written this thing down here. All right, I think I'll just go over to the next uh, page, copy that over. So we have one over two times X plus H add three. 
minus one over two x plus three, all over h. So this is a complex fraction. And my favorite way to simplify a complex fraction is to multiply the top and the bottom by the LCD of all the fractions. So that LCD would be just these two denominators. So it would be two times x plus h, add three times two x plus three. I need to do that on the top and on the bottom. And by the way, I could have distributed that two and then I wouldn't have had to carry around this extra set of parentheses, but that's okay. All right, so take this, um, you know, product of these two LCDs and it's going to get distributed here and here. Oh boy, all right, I have to try to make this fit. Okay, and I, I do like to show my work. So I have my original fraction and that is now being multiplied by, uh, two times x plus h plus three times two x plus three. And then I have the other fraction minus one over two x plus three. And now I'm gonna have to write a little smaller, I think, to make everything fit. I miss my whiteboard. Two times x plus h plus three times, sorry, I gotta do it like this. Okay. And I do like to keep the whole problem together. So let's put the denominator, which is h times two x plus h and three times two x plus three. Okay, so now I can start crossing stuff out. Uh, this two times x plus h plus three will cancel this out. And this two x plus three will cancel this out. And that is going to leave me with two x plus three, this one up here, minus two times x plus h plus three, all over that mess on the bottom, okay, so now all I have to do is start cleaning up the numerator. I should get some more stuff to cancel and ultimately I should be able to get rid of this H on the bottom. All right, so Let's see, um, I think the first thing I would probably do is distribute this two. So that's going to give me two X plus three minus two X plus two H plus three. You know what, I think I'll go ahead and distribute the two here also so I'm not carrying around that extra set of parentheses. And now if you distribute that minus sign, you're going to get uh, 2x plus 3 minus 2x, come on, minus 2h minus 3 all over this thing. And now I can get rid of two X minus two X. I can get rid of three minus three. That's going to leave me with negative two H over H times two X plus two H plus three times two X plus three. 
And the moment you've all been waiting for, the H's will finally cancel. And my final answer for the simplified difference quotient is negative two over two X plus two H plus three times two X plus three. Ta-da. All right, and I think that is finally everything uh, that I wanted to show you for 1.3. So the next section, 1.4, is actually a section that I did not cover at all in trigonometry, uh, but I bet a lot of it will be review from maybe your algebra, uh, one of your algebra classes. So we'll see you then.